Shall we start? Yeah, let's get started. Hello, everybody. Those are, I can't see you. I hope you can see me. I'm Charles Traub. I'm the chairperson of photography and um, video, MFA, SVA. And we're also joined by all our students and students from other places in the school, and in particular, uh, the MFA Fine Art Department, which uh, our guest tonight is actually a grad of. Um, first of all, I want to introduce Adam Bell to you, uh, who has organized this event and uh, is a faculty member, a photographer and critic of distinction. And um, I want to thank him and all the staff who helped us organize this. Uh, to the audience, we have a number of events coming up throughout the semester, and Adam's going to tell you about them. We have them every semester. We're hoping uh, that the future ones can be in person. We have a wonderful, for those who've never been to our facility, it's a wonderful facility uh, that can house a great number of people for a lecture. And we're hoping, as everybody is, that uh, the conditions will lighten up and we will all be together sharing our creative ideas and focus. And um, so with no further ado, Adam, I turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Charlie. Uh, I just wanna extend a welcome to everyone tonight who's joining us. Uh, our students in the MFA Photography, Video and Related Media Department, the students from MFA Fine Arts who are joining us tonight and members of their community, as well as uh, friends, faculty, and alum of our program and anyone in the sort of larger community, uh, welcome tonight. I'm very glad you're joining us. Uh, I'm really excited uh, about tonight's talk. Uh, I'm gonna give a brief introduction to her before and then pass it over to him. Uh, and I also just wanna let you know about some of the upcoming talks that we'll be having in case you wanna join us. And as Charlie said, fingers crossed, most of those will be in person back in our facility, which is on uh, 214 East 21st Street here in uh, Manhattan. Um, as you guys, most of, most of you know, we're all pretty familiar with uh, Zoom webinars. Um, Herb is going to give his talk, and then we're going to conclude it with some Q&A um, that Charlie and I will be facilitating uh, down at the bottom of your screen. Of course, you know there's a Q&A uh, little button. Feel free to enter in questions that you might have as uh, the talk proceeds, and we'll do our best to answer all those. And those can also be entered in uh, at the end, and I hope you will all uh, join us and contribute in that sense. Um, I'm really, as I said, I'm really excited about this talk tonight, uh, and I want to welcome Herb Tam to uh, the department virtually as, as, as we are, and uh, let you know that uh, Herb Tam is the curator and director of exhibitions at the Museum of Chinese in America here in New York City. Um, he recently co-curated co Waves of Identity, 35 Years of Archiving, an exhibition that explores the construction of Chinese American identity through uh, MOCA's ar archival materials. In 2012, he curated America Through a Chinese Lens, which is also the title of tonight's talk, which surveys uh, photographs of America by contemporary artists and non-professional non photographers of Chinese descent. Tam was previously the associator, associate curator of Exit Art and the acting associate curator at the Queens Museum of Art. Tam was born in Hong Kong and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, and he studied at the San Francisco State University and earned his Master's of Fine Arts right here at the School of Visual Arts uh, in New York City. Um, before I finally hand it over, I want to let you guys know about some upcoming talks. Of course, tonight we're honored to have Herb come and talk. Our next event, which we are currently rescheduling, we are very excited to have uh, Philip Shane, who's a filmmaker, screening his film uh, about an alum of our program, Jay Daskow, um, who was also going to be in conversation with Andrew Moore, one of our faculty members. We, in efforts to have as many people as possible and have this event in person, we are hopefully postponing that until uh, mid-March. So stay tuned for that. Um, February 22nd, we're excited to have Vera Luter, who's an alum of our program, 
coming and talking about her work. Um, March 22nd, we're welcoming Nicole Dawn Strathman, uh, who is an art historian and author, and she will be talking about her recent book uh, through Native Lens. Um, later on in April, we will be having our student presentations, and sometime in early April, we're also going to have a film screening put together by faculty member Graham Weinbrenn uh, of a selection of films. And Graham is not only a longtime faculty member, but he's also the editor of the Millennium Film uh, Journal. And hopefully all those events will be happening in place in our department in what we call the big room. Um, if you are curious about these events, I'm going to put in the chat uh, our email and website so that you can uh, contact us for more information. And then without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'll hand things over to uh, Herb to uh, begin his talk. And I just want to again extend a welcome to him and uh, say I'm very excited to hear what he has to share with us. And thank you. Thanks so much, um, Adam and uh, Charles uh, and everybody who helped out um, in pulling this together tonight. Um, uh, I'm dialing in from Flushing, Queens, uh, where I live. Um, our work is mostly remote now, so <clears throat> I'm mostly here and uh, really excited and honored to, to be with you all tonight, uh, talking about a little bit about uh, my work and my perspective on it, um, especially because, you know, I graduated from uh, SVA's MFA program and it was a <clears throat> really formative experience for me, uh, really opened my eyes to kind of a new world and new ways of imagining what art making could be. Um, I used to make paintings and, uh, you know, being at SVA with, uh, you know, my colleagues and being in New York for the first time, I'm from the Bay Area, uh, it, everything was, um, uh, you know, new um, and, Hopefully um, the kind of experience I had uh, is something you're also getting, um, developing that critical eye. Uh, and I know that uh, it's tough to be doing what you're doing now in the middle of a pandemic, but um, I'm sure you know everybody at SVA is making it the best experience they can for you. Um, so what I'm gonna do um, in terms of structure is uh, uh, the, the title of the talk is America Through a Chinese Lens. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, so America Through a Chinese Lens, it's uh, the title of the first exhibition that I uh, curated at the Museum of Chinese in America um, back in 2012. Um, but before I talk about this, um, I kind of want to tell you a little bit about my backstory, my personal history, um, so you get a sense of kind of where I'm coming from um, with, uh, uh, with sort of the meat of the, uh, the talk later on. So uh, I came to New York in 1998. Um, I'm from the Bay Area. Um, and after I graduated from SVA, um, I got involved with a group called Godzilla, Asian American Art Network. Some of you may have heard about them. They uh, were around in the 90s and uh, they were a, a kind of loose collective of Asian American artists um, that uh, would meet, would share each other's work, give critical feedback to each other, organize exhibitions, they famously wrote a letter to the Whitney Biennial or to the Whitney Museum when the 1991 Biennial featured no Asian American artists. Um, and so a lot of their work was around uh, representation and activism. Uh, I got involved with them because I used to work at Creative Capital Foundation right out of school. Um, and part of that small staff was um, Athena Robles and Ken Chu who were part of Godzilla. And they really uh, took me in, especially Athena and showed me a kind of different part of the art world um, that um, you know I, I never knew about. And 
she took me to openings at the Museum of Chinese in America and to um, exhibitions at the Asian American Arts Center in Chinatown. Uh, back then, the Museum of Chinese in America was located at 70 Mulberry Street, which is uh, you might know of as the building that burned down, which contained MOCA's collections. Um, out of um, sort of meeting and getting to know Godzilla, um, I uh, helped form a, another loose network of Asian American artists called Godzuki, which was a sort of, um, uh, you know, offspring of Godzilla. Um, and we did many of the same activities as Godzilla doing um, sort of critiques with each other. Uh, we would go on Sunday dim sums and just catch up and um, make sure that we had um, each other's back and, um, um, you know, we're able to help support each other um, through, I think some really tough times as young artists in New York. Um, so this is through Godzuki is really how I started to get into curating. Um, you know, I'd been making art at the time, holding down a job at Creative Capital Foundation um, and just trying to make it all work. Um, in 2003, I decided to stop making art altogether. Um, by this time I had started to curate. Um, I had uh, done shows from different at different types of venues um, from the American Natural History Museum for their Asian American His uh, History and Heritage Month uh, to the Longwood Art Gallery at uh, Hostos College in, in the Bronx, and then at an empty uh, storefront on Bond Street in Manhattan. And, uh, you know, all of this experience didn't really feel like sort of proper training for a career in curating, but uh, this all led up to uh, being somehow hired to, to be uh, kind of fill in associate curator at the Queens Museum um, for someone who was uh, going on leave. And it was, it was my first job as an institutional curator. And um, I think me leaving, living in Flushing uh, uh, helped a lot in, in uh, landing me the job. From there, I worked for four years or so at um, Exit Art, which uh, was a, a alternative art space in Soho and then later on when I worked there um, in Upper Chelsea. And then in 2011, I got the job at the Museum of, in, of Chinese in America, which was really a dream job for me. As I said, I uh, would go there to openings and it really formed uh, uh, a lot of my sort of consciousness of, of uh, what it meant to be a cultural producer, um, especially within uh, a multicultural and ethnic specific context. Um, so when I started at MOCA, you know, my first few days, um, I sort of felt like we were uh, stuck in a history that we felt all too comfortable telling ourselves. Um, it was a history that was a little bit of a crutch and it seemed to be a problem of imagination, a problem of narrative. Um, it felt all too complete, all too neat and simplistic, and also too one directional. Um, the photograph I'm showing is from uh, MOCA's collection, which is how the museum started as a collection. Um, this image is from the 1970s. Uh, Columbus Park um, pickup basketball game. I love basketball, and I think a lot of people are, would be surprised to to know that uh, basketball has had a long history in Chinatown, um, as far back as the early 20th century. There were club teams that would travel to other parts of um, New York City and play other club teams in Harlem and Brooklyn. Um, and sports was a big, uh, important social activity in Chinatown. There were uh, baseball teams, there were um, volleyball teams and clubs. And um, anyway, it's, a, it's one of my favorite images from, uh, from MOCA's collection. So 
the story I was telling you about. Um, um, the one that we like to tell ourselves, um, the one that I feel like uh, we often get stuck in um, at the museum uh, kind of goes something like this. Um, you know, every, ever since we've started coming to America in the mid 19th century, we've been discriminated against. And if we exist in the American consciousness at all, it's as flat depictions. Uh, here, this is a photo famous, I think maybe probably many of you know, um, the Golden Spike photo 1869 is when uh, the Transcontinental Railroad that connected the East Coast with the West Coast through a railroad line met uh, in Utah um, at Promontory Point. This was a celebratory image uh, that marked the occasion. Um, and what you notice is that even though uh, over 20,000 Chinese um, worked on the railroad, um, just as many as uh, Irish workers, um, in this image, there are no uh, Chinese workers as part of the, celebra the celebration. And it, I think it shows how much invisibility is part of the Chinese American story. Um, but even when we're depicted, uh, it, it's as flat depictions, uh, two dimensional. Um, and as the story goes, uh, Chinese women are seen as exotic temptresses. They're shy, uh, housebound, they're submissive. Um, this is an image of Afang Moi, um, the first, arguably the first Chinese woman to have come to the United States. She came in 1834 um, as um, a, a sort of advertising ploy uh, by a couple of American merchants who brought her over here to display in uh, vignettes like this uh, with sort of oriental furniture or a sort of ideal of oriental furniture. And she was no more than a prop in these uh, staged settings. And um, these merchants were trying to use her to sell things like porcelain and silk, uh, tea, you know, things that were prized among the um, American elite at the time. Uh, men, Chinese men were in, in this version of the story are interchangeable. Uh, they live in crowded, filthy streets of Chinatowns, uh, which are seen as ghettos of sinister and mysterious activities. Um, they're agents of disease, uh, a yellow peril horde of unassimilable coolie labor. Uh, later on, they're seen as model minorities, especially in the, at the height of World War II. Uh, potential spies during the Cold War, Bruce Lee Kung Fu chinks, good at math. And of course, recently, uh, Chinese are the Chinese virus. Uh, this image here is taken, was taken by Arnold Genta, who um, <clears throat> probably a lot of you know, uh, documented Chinatowns um, or San Francisco's Chinatown uh, <clears throat> before the, the 1906 earthquake. So a lot of his images are some of the only surviving ones of uh, Chinatown before the earthquake. And you can see here how uh, much back in those days, Chinatown was uh, a society of bachelors, of men um, who had come over. Uh, some were merchants, some were laborers, um, and they built a community um, uh, that survives today. But the community also um, was much more than uh, a bunch of men. There were also families, young families um, and children. These are also uh, Arnold Genta photographs from MoCA's collection. How did, so how did these images become ingrained in 
the American imagination. Um, Chinese gold miners were driven out of their claims um, in the 1850s. Um, and of course we helped build one of the most important pieces of infrastructure for the modern industrial economy, um, the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, we did this all for low pay and abusive conditions then were recruited to other industries where we faced uh, violent backlashes, hostility, uh, and even more violence. And then finally in a grand stroke, um, America banned Chinese from immigrating to America for over 60 years, uh, cementing our marginal and sublegal status. Uh, and these are all things that we um, at the museum really like to recite. Um, we like to tell ourselves um, it forms the core of a sort of master narrative that um, that, 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 that is part of our DNA. Uh, and we tell ourselves that despite all of these um, events um, and abuses, uh, we've pers persevered um, through struggle. Uh, we've strived, we've sacrificed and made something of ourselves. We've won, we've won legal challenges against discriminatory laws that help define the meaning of what an American is. We fought in wars and marched uh, for civil rights. We don't complain, we work hard and value education, save our money. We buy houses and pass this ethos and property on to the next generation. And we like to tell ourselves that we've succeeded and lived the American dream despite the intractable obstacles in front of us. And this has been mirrored somewhat across various sectors of American life. The story goes, we, we've we keep, kept fighting and we finally earned our way into political offices and mainstream portrayals. Uh, these are some uh, different uh, pieces from MOCA's collection um, kind of showing how pervasive some of the uh, depictions are um, from those earlier days when uh, Chinese were cast as um, exotic uh, uh, sort of non um, assimilable uh, people that were always going to be foreign to this country. Uh, this is one of the more popular uh, pieces in our current core exhibition um, from World War II, how to tell Japs from Japanese or how to tell Japs from Chinese um, through facial features. This was uh, part of a Time Magazine spread and part of a sort of economy uh, and uh, economy of imagery that sought to um, portray Chinese as good Asians and Japanese as America's enemies uh, during World War II. Um, so this is the narrative that I think we've become a used to, we've come become a used to um, at the museum, this narrative of uh, gaining sort of uh, tepid acceptance into mainstream American life and culture and society uh, through 150, 160 years of being discriminated against, of having policies restrict um, Chinese immigration and the sort of apex of it is perhaps these um, kinds of depictions of us by Asians, about Asians, something like crazy rich Asians. But how far have we really come if the possibilities to imagine ourselves in the world are so limited when our subjectivity is reduced to a zero sum game of success uh, or failure? 
um, all while we're still perhaps seen as an alien threat to an American way of uh, an American way of life. Um, so, what is Chinese subjectivity based on? How do we see ourselves, and what new stories can we tell ourselves? Um, so, in 2012, when I first started at the museum, um, you know, all of these things, these questions were running through my mind. Well, why do we have to keep regurgitating these same stories that um, I think a lot of people have a hard time connecting to, even if they're Chinese? Um, a lot of uh, Chinese in America today um, have no connection to a Chinese gold miner or railroad worker or to Afong Moy. Um, and how is their experience uh, reflected in what images and stories Mocha uh, explores and presents and tries to tell? So I decided to organize with that in mind, um, the exhibition America through a Chinese lens. And um, it was a way to think beyond the limits of this grand narrative uh, and to think more about uh, texture and feeling and even the esoteric, um, things that just don't fit into um, any kind of master narrative that we've been talking about. Um, or any already staked out political positions, but which are actually essential ingredients uh, to the formation of an identity, a personal point of view, and different possibilities embedded in um, historical work. Uh, these are just some installation shots of the exhibition. Um, I'll just quickly flip through these. Uh, the exhibition was organized um, into three uh, thematic areas, uh, the natural landscape, uh, the suburbs, and um, the city. And <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the idea of the exhibition, <clears throat> again, was to um, think uh, or see anew what uh, perspective Chinese uh, photographers, whether they're non-professional or uh, working artists, um, how they saw America, different aspects of it, um, to, to start to understand uh, the different ways that uh, Chinese have come to understand uh, the idea of America. Uh, I'm going to go through these specific images in um, detail later, but just wanted to show you the show. Um, so the exhibition sort of began with this um, really incredible photograph by uh, Chung Kwang Chi, who um, probably a lot of you know, he was famous uh, for photographing himself, um, selfies of himself in different um, landmarks across America, the Grand Canyon here, um, Mount Rushmore, World Trade Center, etc. And he was always dressed in what's known as a Mao suit or the kind of uniform that uh, during the Cultural Revolution, uh, men were, um, were often seen wearing in China, um, uh, a kind of um, uh, socialist sort of outfit. Um, in drab colors and he would go around in these, this uniform with sunglasses taking uh, selfies um, in these famous places. And uh, he really cast himself as uh, a perpetual foreigner 
within um, within America. And here, I think what's interesting about this picture and, and different than a lot of his other ones is we don't see his face. Um, instead, he's gazing out into uh, the Grand Canyon um, and I, for me, it was interesting to see uh, and try to imagine what he was thinking about. Um, I think we all kind of, or when we look at his photographs, uh, you know, he he sort of uh, casts himself as a scar almost on the American land, landscape, but here he sort of blends in um, and uh, yeah, it was a great sort of opening um, and foundational photo for the exhibition, really sort of asking the question, you know, what do we see um, in America's landscape? A really important part of the exhibition were um, uh, photographs from our collection, especially amateur photographs. These are um, original prints uh, from various collections in the in our collection, mostly family collections. So uh, a lot of um, tourist photographs. The one on the left is from the Boy Scouts, uh, the Boy, a Boy Scouts chapter in Chinatown. And um, all of these photos here and in this grouping, uh, you know, are of, um, were taken by Chinese Americans in the natural landscape. And uh, it, it was important to see um, photography um, and mix it in with uh, artistic expressions um, and, and to give visitors a sense that, uh, you know, we're also thinking about um, a more vernacular sense of photography and not um, art with a capital A. Um, this next photograph is um, by Wing Young Louis. Um, and, you know, part of the, um, this section about the natural landscape of America is really, um, it was really focused on tourism um, and tourist photographs, and um, and it was important for uh, for for us to think through that uh, because a lot of our uh, association with the natural landscape is through tourism and a sort of innocence of looking and being kind of in awe of um, the wonders of America and. Uh, you know, thinking about a kind of idealized version of the country through its physical features uh, was something we wanted to think through and how um, that idealism kind of bleeds into a sense of uh, what it means to be um, America and American in um, all different kinds of uh, ways. Um, the idealism of uh, freedom associated with the American landscape, the idea of um, democracy even. Um, and we wanted to uh, help visitors think through how uh, tourist photography could touch on all of these different kinds of ideas. And so this is a photograph by Wing Young Louis in, uh, as part of his Looking for Asian America series, he drove across um, the country photographing um, different Asian American communities. Uh, this is a really great image to me of, um, you know, people who are photographing themselves, photographing, uh, photographing the natural landscape. And there's a kind of, like loop that's established here. Um, and, a, and again, a kind of innocence that I really like. Uh, this is a, another one from 
Wing Young, Wing Young Hu, Hui's uh, series, a very different kind of uh, tourist photograph. Um, we see how flat, this is taken in Death Valley, um, a very flattened uh, image of um, a young girl um, probably having her picture taken by her parents. Um, and it's a sort of image of the sort of banality, uh, the boredom of uh, tourism. Um, this is, whoops, this is by Ann Wu, who um, is based in Hong Kong. <clears throat> Um, and this is a photograph of Niagara Falls. She um, also photographed America's sky <clears throat> at, in different places. Um, these are actual photographs of, um, you know, a, a daytime sky, um, obviously uh, digitally enhanced, um, but essentially she was really amazed by uh, the, the colors and the hues that you could find in, um, in in the sky in America, whereas in Hong Kong, her sky was often very gray and overcast. Um, and this kind of expresses the a sense of wonder at um, uh, at what America kind of has to offer. Sort of symbolizes that. Uh, this photograph of. Uh, this particular American landscape, this was, I believe, taken in California, but it um, obviously has echoes of Andrew Wyeth's um, iconic Christina's World uh, painting, and it was very deliberately staged, uh, photographed by Kaman Se, also um, New York-based, um, but um, from Hong Kong. Um, this kind of tableau is, uh, I, I think, uh, especially with Andrew Wise painting, very much uh, quintessential America, especially of a certain period. And uh, Kaman restaged it, um, updated it, um, included her own uh, character. The thing that's missing is the house um, that, you know, in why is painting is a really important element in um, um, in this composition. Um, but for Kaman, she uh, uh, took it out so that the relationship between um, this character and the landscape um, is much more um, undefined. Another. <clears throat> A uh, piece from this theme uh, of the American landscape is this is by Arthur O, who um, his work uh, really centers on um, photography itself, uh, the the structure of it, the mechanisms of it, and the systems of um, display uh, that are often at work that um, sort of grounds our understanding of a, of a picture. Uh, and in this case, uh, he took this picture in Yosemite, the national park. Um, and it's a photograph of a painting that he made, um, a Chinese style traditional ink painting that he made and then uh, tossed out into Mirror Lake in uh, Yosemite and then photographed uh, that painting as it kind of dissolved in the water. And um, I think for him, there, there's a sort of connection with photography in the sense of um, the development process in analog photography, you know, having uh, a, a print sit in uh, a solution and having it, um, having the image appear in this case his painting um, sort of disappears um, and the connection between a Chinese landscape that's painted 
and a photographed uh, uh, American landscape. Um, these are all tensions that I think he was really interested in uh, working through in, in this series of works. Uh, this photograph is by Hai Jang, who um, is New York based. Uh, and he uh, went down to um, Alabama and uh, did a series of photographs uh, in Alabama that were based on, um, I'm forgetting the photographer, photographer's name, but um, a really famous series of works that uh, Hai Jang went down to Alabama to sort of pay tribute to um, um, in the same town that this seminal photography, photographer went to, uh, to, to shoot photos. And this was his, for Hai, this uh, project was really like him trying to get to know a part of America that he had really little connection to um, and really, kind of staked his work to a tradition of photography, um, you know, going back many decades of uh, going around the country and um, using photography as a way to get to know um, people and to understand what uh, America actually is and how um, it's different in various parts of the country. <clears throat> Another one from Hai Jang. Um, so another idea that was really central to uh, the exhibition um, that I really wanted to draw out uh, was the idea of boredom. And, um, and also the, the link to the automobile um, and this is something that is very, is a very personal thing to me. I grew up in California and cars were more than just ways to get around, but there were social spaces. There were, you know, um, uh, marks of identity. They were, um, they kind of like, uh, linked you to a certain kind of lifestyle or a certain click. Sorry, I'm going to get rid of this, um, pop-up here. Give me a second, apologies. I have this like weird bug on my computer that every so often I have to get rid of. <clears throat> okay, sorry about that. <clears throat> so I was talking about um, the car and uh, and how important it is, uh, especially on the West Coast, uh, when I was growing up, um, the kind of car you had sort of really pinned you to uh, uh, a, a certain clique or um, a certain kind of demographic. Uh, but there are also spaces where, um, you know, you spend so much time in trying to figure out what next to do. And this is what this photograph kind of uh, triggers for me. Um, this is a photograph by uh, Chen'an Yuan from Chicago, who um, the series is uh, from a uh, series that he did that is um, <clears throat> called City of Light, City of Sorrow. Um, there are uh, film stills, as he calls them. So kind of um, in, in a similar tradition as uh, Cindy Sherman. Um, and I think he was really looking to portray Asians as uh, uh, very different than the kind of tropes that um, we had gotten used to, that the museum had been um, so used to telling. Um, so instead of you know these um, people who had come over for certain kinds of work, um, who were discriminated against, and and uh, and then excluded from coming to the country. You know, these are in Chen An's eyes, very contemporary figures. They were lost in um, 
their own world. Um, they're lost in their own thoughts um, and they're trying to figure out what to do next and they have no answers. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're just, they're trying to figure it out. And um, this kind of sense of boredom is something that, uh, that this depicts is something that I could relate to so much more than um, some of these other depictions that uh, I was talking about earlier. Um, this is an image by Kaman Se. Again, um, it's one that I think, uh, you know, you can really form a narrative between this image and Kaman's. Um, you, this might be uh, the headlight that you see here might be coming from these guys. And uh, <clears throat> this woman, it's another stage photograph by Kaman. Uh, looks like she's coming out of a 7-Eleven. And it's another thing I could really relate to is sitting in a, the parking lot of a 7-Eleven um, trying to um, think of where we could go next. And it, this suburban milieu, the suburban boredom, I think is, is very much part of uh, growing up um, Chinese American or Asian American um, for a lot of people. And uh, I think probably even if you're not Chinese or Asian American, this sense of boredom is very much part of suburban life. And it's something that in the exhibition, we really try to um, explore. Another common image. Uh, all of her photographs are staged, um, even though it might look like, you know, just like a snapshot. Um, so she really, um, I think is connected to a lot of photographers you all might know, Gregory Crutzen, uh, Jeff Wall, et cetera, playing with narrative. Um, this is the work of Amy Yao, her past series. Um, these are actually photographs of reflections from uh, cars, parked cars in New York City. Um, and they were displayed uh, like this leaning against um, a kind of metal uh, edge or, or thin shelf. Um, I think boredom is another subject taken on by Julie Kwan, who was in the exhibition with uh, photographs of her family. Um, this is her extended family in New Jersey. This is her cousin playing uh, video games and uh, for me, the, the details I think are um, really, they really resonate to me. The white carpet, the, the TV stand, um, you know, that computer terminal to the right of the TV stand, this sort of makeshift seating um, and just the kind of isolation of, uh, of living in this kind of place, um, which for a lot of immigrants is kind of the American dream. Um, but for, you know, perhaps people like this boy, um, uh, it, it's something that he might need distractions from. Um, and it, for me, at least it was, uh, this reminds me of the kind of suffocating experience of growing up in the suburbs. Um, this is a photograph uh, by Wen Young Huey again. Um, I think his project uh, going across America, taking pictures of Asian Americans uh, was kind of a very direct uh, reference to and sort of homage to um, Robert Frank. Um, and um, you know, he really did go everywhere and documented not just, not just Asian American life, but um, a, a lot of ways in which um, Asian Americans and and others um, interacted and and uh, built communities together. Another one by Wing Young Huey. Um, 
uh, come on, say again, um, photograph of, uh, I think Sarah D. Roosevelt Park down in uh, lower Chinatown. Again, this is staged, um, even though it, it looks like a candid snapshot. Uh, just returning back to uh, some of the amateur photographs that we included. These are all of uh, folks in the suburbs, Chinese Americans in um, their, their homes or out in their yard, um, shoveling snow, uh, ice skating, um, seemingly enjoying the, the fruits of a hard won suburban life. Um, this is Kaman Say again. And this is a photograph by uh, Yan, Yan Dong, who um, I really love this photograph. And um, it's uh, it, it's sort of hard, maybe hard to figure out at first upon first glance, but what's happening here is uh, there's a photograph of two young men uh, from behind, but they have their shirts on backwards. Um, <clears throat> so it looks as if uh, their faces are sort of blacked out, but it's actually their hair. Um, and it's a, it's a really kind of surrealistic uh, image. Um, and it makes me think when I look at it of this idea of um, Asians and Chinese as interchangeable uh, or kind of unrecognizable. Um, we are sometimes seen as, you know, no more than copies of each other um, with very little personality um, and uh, almost robotic. Um, and this image kind of plays on that in a humorous way. Um, for me, uh, it also makes me think of the idea of of copies in Chinese culture uh, as being very uh, could be very different than how uh, in the West uh, uh, how the idea of copying can be seen. Um, in the West, there's a, a sort of cult of the original, the cult of the 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 creator of an original um, photograph or artwork. Um, whereas in Chinese culture, the idea of uh, a copy isn't um, seen as less than an original. And I think that you can see this in the ways that uh, artifacts are uh, sometimes cared for or uh, um, you know, how they're kept in, in uh, Chinese museums and in Chinese uh, historical sites. Uh, often uh, precious artifacts are reproduced um, and sent out to museums in the West um, or in the case of uh, certain Buddhist shrines, um, they're uh, replicas are produced um, every few decades to replace uh, uh, the quote unquote originals. And this idea of um, a, a more fluid sense of an original, um, I think is a, is a really um, interesting um, difference between um, sort of an, an American or Western way of looking at uh, a creative act and um, how you might think about creativity from a, from a Chinese perspective. Um, so that's just something that uh, this photograph makes me think of and consider. Um, just thinking about that was the last image that I wanted to show as part of um, 
America through a Chinese lens, but just thinking about that was 10 years ago, that exhibition and so much has changed in 10 years. Um, and one of the things I wanted to point out um, as I end this talk is uh, some of the possibilities that have emerged in those 10 years. Um, bubble tea, uh, maybe some of you know about them already, but uh, they're a collective uh, of artists and designers who throw uh, these parties, um, you know, every Lunar New Year, but sometimes for different occasions. Um, and they're really uh, a safe space for the Asian American queer um, LGBTQ community. Um, and they really uh, open up a space to allow people to experiment with identity um, to try on different identities, to um, kind of go wild with references, um, traditional references, um, depictions of Chinese and Asians that have cast us in a uh, really negative light. Um, they, they love to use those and remix those with other references um, in their stagings, in their posters and uh, and the people who come out to their parties also, the way they dress, the way they perform um, is really uh, something that uh, I think 10 years ago would have been very um, hard to imagine happening. So I want to shout them out. And then finally, I uh, wanted to leave on this note, this image uh, from, uh, I believe 2014 uh, by the late Corky Lee <clears throat> photographer who was kind of self anointed as the official um, photographer of the Asian American experience. And when he was a kid, he was saw the photograph I showed you first of, um, Transcontinental Railroad and its completion, uh, missing all of these Chinese Americans who were part of the building of the railroad. He saw that when he was a kid and, and really felt something was wrong. And um, uh, about six years ago, he decided to try to heal this historic wound and he got, um, people together, people who were uh, descendants of railroad workers to go back to the original site in Utah and um, photographed uh, them in front of this, the, the, the two trains meeting ceremoniously for um, the completion of the railroad. And um, he's, you know, before he passed away, he did it um, every year um, in May uh, to honor, you know, those workers. Um, and it's a, for him, uh, photo photography was really a way to, um, build on Asian American activism. Um, and it, it was a way to, um, tell a different story than what, uh, what we had been told. And, um, so I wanted to leave on this work because, uh, you know, he passed away of COVID um, last year and uh, a really important uh, photographer, American photographer that uh, everybody should know about. Um, and with that, I'm gonna um, end there. And I'm um, sorry I went over time, but, you know, happy to take any uh, questions. Thank you. You didn't go over time and uh, it's pretty exciting. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Then. That was great. Thank you, Herm. Um, I just want to invite the audience. Um, you guys have the the chat and also the the Q and A box down at the bottom. You can type in any questions that you might have, um, and I'm sure Herb will be happy to answer them. Um, 
There was one, there's one in there that popped in the beginning that uh, someone was asking if you could repeat the name of the organization of Asian American Collective that you talked about. I think it was Godzilla or yeah. um, maybe I think there was another one as well. Yeah, Godzilla was um, the older collective from 1990 to 2000. Their official name was Godzilla colon Asian American uh, Art Network. And then um, the one I helped found after that was called Godzuki, uh, G-O-T-Z-O-O-K-I-E. <clears throat> um, there's a good book on both of these uh, collectives uh, that I'll look for and put in the, the chat, um, written by Alexandra Chang. Um, it's a history of these two collectives and, and a couple others as well. Thank you. Those are, we'll get them for, if the library doesn't have them, we'll get them, make sure they get them. Herb, um, I just, I, I said it, but I realized I was on uh, mute. I, I think this is really terrific and it needs to be <laughs> visited further on, uh, particularly your, your personal take as an Asian American on the various photographs you showed, how they perhaps and do reflect uh, your feeling and experience of growing up, uh, particularly in California, the things that you mentioned. Uh, I'd like to lead off with a question uh, and, or rather uh, an interest if nothing else. As we've been starting looking at, at you know, various ethnic groups through photography, and there's certainly more interest in this issue than ever before. It seems to me that the vernacular albums that may have been made from the teens up to World War II uh, photo album, even into the 50s, are of great value in understanding the domestic and personal lives, not only of, of everybody in America and there are collectors who collect these albums, but uh, those of Asian Americans and also indigenous Americans are very rare and hard to find. And uh, I would love to know your take on that and also home movies, which are, would be really telling uh, mm. to have a presentation <clears throat> of both of those concerns. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I agree. I mean, I think, with um, you know, photo albums uh, from the early 20th century. Um, so little of that exists for Chinese Americans. Those that, those that we do know of, you know, they're um, um, you know, only like the sort of upper class, the merchant class um, were able to uh, have those kind of portraits taken and had access to that kind of um, documentation of their lives. So, um, you know, there's a big uh, part that's just, you know, we're never going to find, which is of um, the kind of working class uh, folks and, and, you know, what they looked like, what they wore, um, their, their living conditions and so forth, um, especially in that, kind of early 20th century to the 50s. Um, our collection is much stronger like after that mm -hmm. in the 60s, 70s and 80s um, and home movies, you know, just the same. We have some uh, home movies that document um, sort of parades and Lunar New Year festivals in Chinatown, but um, you know, not, not much else from those earlier days, so. That, um, yeah, that, that, that it always surprised me because that's the same answer I've gotten several places. But, you know, a Brownie Hawkeye or a snapshot camera was not that unaffordable. I'm not talking about formal family portraits, but rather, if, you know, a young kid has a mm. camera or, you know, the, the movie camera would be a little rare, but a film camera. But uh you know, the Brownie Hawkeyes or that kind of thing. Surely those things existed in communities. And I just wonder what happened 
to those kind of photographs, you know, they don't even show up in flea markets or anything like that. It, you know, it's very rare, which is maybe people still are holding on to them. But that may also be the case. Yeah, I think that's another thing is, uh, you know, how accessible they are to public yeah. uh, archives and, and you know, to like, measures, yeah. yeah, or some, you know, might have just gotten thrown away, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're kind of actively looking for things like that, not just in New York City, but across the country. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, there are a lot of institutions like us, us across the country and uh, we're trying to like support the work that those people are doing in, in collecting things like that. Um, and often they're, you know, sitting in people's like basements and uh, attics and so forth. And, you know, um, I think it's a, it, it's a matter of people knowing that there are places right. like us that would take care of things like that. Yeah. I, I've got actually, I want to, someone typed in a question, but I have a, also have a follow-up question to maybe Charlie. So the quick question that it, someone typed into the Q&A is they wanted to know the name of the artist of the two men who were holding the cup and the pear behind mm -hmm. their back. Yeah. And then I guess my follow-up question to maybe Charlie is, I wonder if there's any uh, differences and variety that you can speak to in terms of the kinds of photographs that were being made in different Chinese American communities, maybe in the East Coast, in New York City, in like San Francisco and elsewhere, uh, sort of older historical images that might shed light on the different experiences of those communities in the United States. Hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, first of all, the artist name um, with the two guys and um, uh, with their heads facing, with their backs facing us, um, Yan Deng, Y A N, and then D D E N G. Uh, he's based in Beijing now, but he uh, was in New York. He studied at Parsons. Um, and yeah, in terms of your question, uh, Adam, <clears throat> I mean, there are a lot more similarities just on on face value of uh, images taken, you know, out in like California or the West Coast versus those in the, the East Coast. Um, you know, w when you look at images from the same periods um, uh, of those two places, you'll see like a lot of things that are pretty much the same, um, you know, uh, a lot of sort of portrait photography of a certain period, uh, big families um, or big gatherings in, in restaurants or associations or social clubs marking like um, an important uh, uh, diplomat who came to town or uh, et cetera. And so, you know, those are very consistent for both. Um, I think it's when you start looking at like the, the smaller details that you, you get to see like a different portrait of life in those two places. Um, you know, San Francisco, Chinatown being much older um, and having gone through an earthquake, the, the architecture is very uh, different because of that. Um, in New York's Chinatown, the Chinatown was kind of built around these tenement buildings that we're already there and we're kind of modified um, to, uh, you know, suit the needs of the Chinese community. Um, and at a certain point, um, some of the buildings were sort of orientalized given um, uh, sort of ornate treatments um, that you could sort of generically define as Chinese. Um, and those kind of details are very particular to this Chinatown. Um, as opposed to uh, the, the Chinatowns in the West Coast. So um, yeah, I mean, in the set in the 70s and 80s, when I think there was a lot more street photography happening, um, you know, you get to see this a lot more of the kind of um, like 
structural differences in the, in the ways people lived here versus there. Um, and I think that's when back then, you know, you start to see photographs of uh, uh, people's homes, the interior life of uh, the Chinese communities in these different places, um, especially uh, those of the working class, whereas before you would you would never see how somebody lived. Um, uh, it was more often like, you know, portrait photographs or very, very sort of staged um, group photographs. That's great, thank you. Um, we actually have a question from Mark Tribe, who, as many of you know, is the, the chair of MFA Fine Arts. Um, and so I'll, I'm just gonna read what he wrote here in the Q&A so everyone can see it. First, he wanted to thank you for your, your excellent talk and important work. He said he had a question about the master narrative of Chinese American experience that you described. How has it changed or expanded in the decades since you curated America through a Chinese lens? I'm particularly curious about the story, how the, about the story, how, how it's been affected by two things. One, the recent history of China, economic growth, global influence, events in Hong Kong, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, the repression of the Uyghurs, and two, uh, the March uh, 2021 Atlanta shootings and the subsequent stop API uh, hate movement. Yeah, wow. Uh, yeah, thank you for that question, Mark. It's a lot. It's, it's a lot. Um, but I love it. Uh, you know, I, in, in terms of like how it's changed in the last 10 years since the show, um, it's gotten all the more complicated um, and all the more layered. Um, you know, even before, even when we were doing that show, we knew that uh, there was um, a large population of Chinese in America who just didn't um, connect with the stories we were trying to tell, this master narrative that you, you, you talk about. And then I talked about, you know, it was just hard for a lot of people to relate to, you know, thinking of new um, uh, immigrants who moved here to come to, you know, places like SFA, SVA or or other graduate programs um, from China who, who you know, um, don't have a connection to uh, railroad work or gold mining or uh, World War II veterans, et cetera. Um, so that, you know, that, I think that experience um, of new immigrants is something that, um, you know, you know uh, definitely makes the master narrative, like not, not just a simple, you know, um, cause and effect thing. Um, because the reasons that people moved here, that immigrated here, you know, are so different from era to era and often um, involves much more than uh, economic factors, but, you know, um, but, you know, go to different desires and different pressures um, and those different pressures and desires are something we also want to uh, talk about, uh, you know, not just like the grand macro structural stuff, <clears throat> but the things that are at the heart of like um, a, a very personal experience and, and drive to do something. Um, so, you know, the economic growth um, that you talked about and China's sort of rise um, in the last, you know, really 40 years since uh, Deng Xiaoping's um, economic reforms. Like that's something we're gonna talk much more about, um, you know, as we, uh, uh, as we think about like a different way to tell like the Chinese American story <clears throat> and definitely like, you know, uh, the events in Hong Kong and what's happening in Xi, with Xi Jinping and, um, what's happening with the Uyghurs. Obviously those, you know, all those things are very delicate subjects for a place like us. And it's something we have to be um, uh, careful about how we talk about those things, um, honestly. But, uh, you know, we're gonna try to address them if, if not in um, our exhibitions and in public programming and 
Um, I think it's hard for us to take any kind of side on anything as a museum, as a history museum, but you know, knowing that these issues are uh, really important to, um, to our public and those who feel connected to the museum, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna try to uh, grapple with them or at least help um, uh, visitors and our audience um, explore it and address it. Um, and then with the Atlanta shootings, the recent, you know, surge in anti-Asian hate, um, I think what's interesting, I mean, we've responded to it in different ways. We've done exhibitions about it and we've done programming around, um, around this. Um, but I think what's really interesting is how much uh, people have become really educated on the history of, um, of uh, the Asian American movement, um, become educated on um, immigration and the history of um, these kinds of uh, the, the kind of racialization of disease and the racialization of immigration law. And it's, um, you know, because people have gotten really educated about it, I think it, as a museum, we have to think about um, a, a kind of new approach that takes into account that people already know about the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Page Act, um, you know, they already know what model minority means. They already um, have discussed at length, you know, uh, the influence of Pearl Buck, et cetera. So um, we're, I think we're really like impressed at how uh, people in the community have responded to things that have been so uh, destructive and, um, <clears throat> um, and you know, seeing that how people are trying to build uh, connections and uh, create space uh, and educating themselves on uh, these histories, um, I think makes sort of in a way eases the pressure for us to to do a lot of, a lot of that. But and and also, um, I think there's like new opportunities to to again like try to tell different stories. Um, because the old stories are already <clears throat> um, have already been kind of digested. So, any other questions? People can uh, again, please. Big task forward. ahead of you. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I, I have another question. I, I'd be interested to hear, like, how <clears throat> since during your tenure at the museum, how the collection has changed in like areas that you focused on in terms of new acquisitions or materials that you felt were important that the museum had that maybe you didn't have? Um... Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, it's, um, it, there's a lot of strengths in our collection, but there's a lot of holes too. <clears throat> and a lot of the holes are from the much earlier part of the story of Chinese in America. Uh, descendants of railroad <clears throat> workers and gold miners and um, those kinds of things that are really strong in the West Coast and something that we're lacking. <clears throat> so we're looking for um, um, for those kinds of materials. And then um, and then also more recently, the experiences of people who you know moved here not long ago, um, who are first generation immigrants. Um, people who come from Fujian province um, or other uh, regions of China or other diasporas, whether it be Hong Kong or Taiwan or Vietnam. Um, those are stories um, and artifacts that we're really like uh, uh, looking for, for the collection. Um, um, and it's really the stories connected to the artifacts that are important to us. So not just like, you know, the the precious thing, but like what story comes along with that and what um, does that thing unlock in terms of like a narrative that is part of um, 
a kind of larger quilt of the Chinese American experience. Um, so yeah, we're really looking for um, the, the a kind of newer um, stories of newer waves of immigrants um, um, and trying to build up that part of the collection so that uh, later on when we are planning exhibitions like America through a Chinese lens, you know, 10, 15 years from now, there can be more of those, the stories of um, recent immigrants. Uh, picking up just on that, I mean, do you have advice about how and where and what maybe young Chinese American serious photographers and artists might be turning to. Um, I mean, a lot of people, because of the nature of the art world and, and in the media turn more inward or to what they call uh, conceptual, but it seems to me there's much to be, I don't like the word document, but to look at in the real world. Do you have any advice? Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, just working at a history, social history museum, <clears throat> you know, I love seeing um, documentary work. Um, and I think there could be much more of it in, in our community um, and different ideas about what documentation means uh, would be great. You know, I, haven't, um, I think there's a, there's a kind of younger group of documentary photographers in the Chinese American community that were, were sort of uh, mentored by Corky Lee. Um, they're doing exciting things. Um, so more of that, but also more, <clears throat> you know, just sort of peer experimentation, uh, kind of following <clears throat> um, very personal um, ideas and uh, instincts <clears throat> about what makes a photograph a photograph and a picture a picture and really challenging the um what photography could be uh would be exciting i think nfts are something that probably like a lot of people are thinking about and having to answer questions about and i think that's a, obviously could be a really interesting space for to subvert or to um, try things out in. <clears throat> it's obviously a market. And I think it's a way to, uh, um, it's another kind of platform to explore and hopefully people can see it for more than just a market, but as a way to, um, as a way to sort of flatten the experience of how to distribute something like an image. Um, so I would, yeah, I would like to see experimentation on, on all different levels, not just documentary photography, but um, with the medium itself and, and, and even not photography, but, but other, other mediums and um, strategies. Well, I think on that, we're gonna have to end um unless there's any other questions someone wants to ask please type it in now <laughs> yeah as we as we wrap things up do you do you have any upcoming shows or projects that you're working on that you want to share that people can maybe see at the museum uh in the coming months and new year yeah our current exhibition is called responses um asian american voices resisting the tides of racism and it's uh um, it's all about tracing the roots of anti-Asian hate um, and also um, features responses from people in our community uh, to what's been happening. Um, and so there's a lot to learn. There's a, um, a film that we created and produced um, that is a, um, a stitched together series of oral histories uh, of people who were, have been living through the pandemic and living through um, anti-Asian racism and calls for racial justice um, and the killings in Atlanta. 
Um, so I think it's, uh, you know, we try to create like uh, a space where people can feel safe and, and kind of think through and process um, all these things that have been happening uh, to our community. Um, and that's up until uh, March 27th. And then on our website, you'll see like a lot of events, virtual events that we're doing for the Lunar New Year, which is coming up in a couple weeks. Um, so, you know, um, you know, hope y'all can tune into some of that. But yeah, um, really appreciate uh, Charles and Adam uh, and everybody at uh, MFA, Photo and SVA, you know, the opportunity to uh, to talk and, and show a little um, of what we have in our collection and, uh, and, and, and explore a little bit the past exhibition. I, th um, I think one final thing we might later when we can be more mobile and as a group, hopefully have maybe come down with some students and look at the collection for those interested. So oh, absolutely, you know, anytime, yeah. uh, whenever it's safe to gather, you know, we'd love to welcome you all down to, to MOCA in the collection and uh, show you around. Okay. Hey, everybody, thank you so much, Herb. Thank, thank you, you so everybody much. for coming. Thank you, all, everybody who's in the audience. Feel free to connect with us and you may have other questions coming up and we'll forward them. Thank you. Sounds good. Thanks right. a lot, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank